convene. Uh, this is the 11.30 session uh, on political theology, political practice, and questions of allegiance. Uh, we have two speakers uh, who have decided to go in the order in which they're presented on the program, which conceptually means we're moving from the general to the particular. Our first speaker is Ellen Stonewall, who is one of my colleagues here at DePaul. Uh, and Alex will be talking about uh, political allegiances, religious faith, and, and being a European. Alex, you Thank you. is on the challenge of uh, being a European Catholic. And uh, I'm sorry I missed uh, yesterday's morning session on, uh, on, on Europe, uh, but I invite the speakers kind of to, to correct me or to compliment me or to comment on, on my paper afterwards because I tried to, uh, I found this kind of these first days very, very engaging and I'm trying to kind of connect it to some of the points of, of other speakers uh, for the sake of, uh, of creating uh, more uh, dialogue instead of having to listen to, to my monologue. Um, it's also written from four, from four perspectives. Um, kind of this conference is about multiple belongings, so I want to be uh, transparent and open about uh, my belongings as well, so you can better situate where I'm coming from. Um, firstly, uh, I'm a European, I'm an Austrian citizen, I grew up in Germany, I sat in the UK, um, I lived in Italy where I did my PhD, um, so I have a strong enthusiasm for, for the European project. Uh, I'm also a Catholic who has a great love uh, for the church in both its uh, metaphysical form but also its institutional form with all its uh, flaws. Um, thirdly, I'm a political scientist, so I'm not here as a theologian. Um, I'm also uh, not an expert on political theology. I come more from uh, the field of religion, politics, religion, international uh, uh, relations. Uh, fourthly, I'm a young person, relatively young, uh, about 30. Uh, and uh, so it's a different generational dynamic. I know some of you, uh, the older generation, are very much shaped by the experience of the Second Vatican Council, which was seen as a positive break for the past, and I have no experience, of course, of the pre-Vatican uh, period. I rather have the experience uh, of growing up in increasingly uh, secularized uh, Europe. European uh, Catholicism, uh, the faith, piety, and religious tradition that historically has shaped Europe's culture uh, and values more than any other religious belief system or political ideology is under great pressure. The galloping secularization of Europe, plummeting church attendance rates, and an ever-growing disconnect between popular culture and religion are pointing towards a far-reaching and radical transformation of European Catholicism. Given today's uh, postmodern pluralism in Europe, faith is becoming a difficult personal choice rather than a widely shared heritage that is part and parcel identity. As a young European Catholic who studied, lived, and worshipped in Austria, Germany, the United States, Wales, France, England, Belgium, Italy, and Chile, I often get smiled at when people find out I'm a practicing Catholic. How can a young, intelligent, cosmopolitan man like you still, the emphasis being on the still, adhere to such an outdated thing as the Catholic faith? I sometimes get asked amusingly, if not disparagingly. Occasionally, people express admiration. In contrast to similar conversations in North or South America, however, I never leave such encounters with the feeling that it simply is normal to be a Catholic Christian in Europe. In the secular and highly diverse context of today's Europe, what, if any, future does European Catholicism have, especially for young people? Can it be saved from what appears to be an unprecedented and inevitable demise? In this paper, I want to discuss the main theme of this conference in the European context. Note that the title of my paper focuses on the challenge of being a European Catholic rather than Catholic European. We're more interested in looking how other identities shape uh, Catholic Christian identities rather than vice versa. Arguably, the substantive uh, becomes the prioritized aspect, Catholic, and the adjective becomes secondary, even if only so marginally. Accepting this hierarchical differentiation between the substantive and the adjective the question immediately arises whether one is first and foremost a European or a Catholic. So 
the pur purpose of this paper, uh, the focus is on being a Catholic, uh, although being one in, in, in the geographical context of Europe. I will make admittedly pessimistic argument that European Catholics are an endangered species. In a nutshell, Catholicism in Europe is in a crisis whose long-term cultural, theological, and political transformations are still difficult to foresee. And also, despite uh, the successes of the last 60 years, Europe as a political normative project is in a crisis too. Uh, as we're witnessing the emergence or re-emergence of, of anti-European thought and practice by both the extreme political left and the extreme political right. It personally saddens me to discuss the demise of European Catholicism in this paper, but I believe that some sort of analysis in order to create an authentic and faithful turnaround. One lesson we learned uh, during this week is the importance of cultural and geographical context when discussing the theological, political, and personal problem of faithfully living out the Catholic Christian tradition in a world where many different ideologies and groups also expect loyalty and commitment. In contrast to Stanley Haubas and Michael Batty, who warn us about the seductive temptations of capitalism and nationalism in the North American context, or Emmanuel Katongola, who is concerned about the way the blood of tribalism uh, often traps the waters of baptism in Europe, uh, the biggest concern, I argue, uh, the biggest problem facing uh, European Catholics is liberal secularism. Together with a strong commitment to pragmatism and materialism, the contemporary liberal secular European mind exalts the autonomy of the individual, thus transforming faith into increasingly challenging personal choice. And uh, I haven't kind of thought this out more widely, but I would think I would actually kind of categorize this liberal secularism as nothing normal, but almost kind of uh, as uh, something idolatrous in the, in the, in the kind of way kind of uh, Bill Kavanaugh kind of laid out uh, his, his argument. So it's kind of something, an existing kind of God uh, that competes uh, with, uh, with the biblical uh, God in Europe. Existing secular and liberal structural pressure makes it highly unlikely, if not impossible, to save European Catholicism as we know it. The Catholic Church will neither regain its former hegemonic grip on European culture and values as conservatives hope, nor will it conform to the postmodern zeitgeist as liberals wish. Rather, current trends suggest that Catholic life is increasingly coalescing not around the traditional parish, but around the diverse, smaller, yet spiritually vibrant communities, spiritual centers, and pilgrimage sites. The church is becoming materially poorer, and its constitutional privileges are more and more difficult to defend. In the future, European Catholicism will take an increasingly critical stance vis-a-vis -vis the surrounding culture, and will have to be a missionary <coughs> church in a different, if not hostile, environment. What I want to do next is to discuss the disconnect, this disconnect between culture and Christianity in Europe. And I want to use uh, my colleague Michael Buddy's book, uh, The Borders of Baptism, uh, as a starting point for doing so. Uh, so Michael argues that if Christians only took ecclesial solidarity more seriously, either their allegiance to Jesus Christ and their bonds to fellow Christians around the world, as well as humanity at large, politics as usual would become radically converted. Rival sources of uh, identity and uh, Buddy's particular concern with the idolatries of uh, patriotism, capitalism, racism, would they have less, if any, impact on the attitudes and practices of baptized Christians? Such a change of heart, uh, Buddy claims, is imperative, as the inability of churches across confessional divide, divides, I quote, to form people into more than nominal or cultural Christians is one of the scandals of our age. The Catholic Church, Buddy regrets, is actually the trailblazers at least effective in forming the affections dispositions and priorities of its would-be adherents. But it deplores that Christianity tends to be too comfortable with patriotism, neoliberal capitalism, thus reducing itself to an integral part of uh, mainstream culture, rather than an independent uh, prophetic force that critically examines popular beliefs and prevailing policies in the light of the gospel. But by this critical of the convergence between culture as it is and Christianity as it is, he makes the normative argument that there should be a divergence between culture as it is and Christianity as it ought to be. Uh, underpinning these normative arguments are two important implicit assumptions, I believe. First, Christianity is an attractive way of life. Um, secondly, Christianity actually enjoys a meaningful presence if only in a nominal <coughs> manner. And I would argue that both assumptions are very true for the United States. A much bleaker and more complicated picture emerges if we try to apply by these arguments to European contexts where we no longer can assume that Christianity is widely seen as an attractive way of life and where even the nominal uh, presence of Christianity uh, is really kind of going uh, uh, dramatically downwards. The secular liberal pressure on the Catholic Church is considerably stronger in Europe than it is in the US. This does not mean that there is a lead-driven 
conspiracy to push religion out of the public sphere, as some conservative Catholics claim. The pressure is both deeper and more powerful as it takes place on a structural level. In the past, Europeans were Catholics, Protestant, Orthodox, Anglican, or Jewish, with some pockets of Muslim population in the Balkans. With some tragic exceptions, uh, such as the Jewish ghettos, the surrounding culture and religion formed a part of a coherent whole. It was easy to be religious, perhaps too easy to be religious. It was considerably more difficult at time, dark times, even deadly, to purposely reject the religion of one's culture. Um, a series of complex political, economic, and social upheavals, transformations, and challenges increasingly drove a wedge between this intrinsic linkage between the religion and mainstream culture. The French Revolution sowed the seeds of a strong anti-clerical tradition and put man rather than God at the center of political philosophy. 19th century philosophers such as Marx, Feuerbach, and Freud provide the first powerful intellectual reasons for modern atheism and agnosticism. Nazism subjected the Jewish population to genocide and communism led to persecution of Christianity. The sexual revolution of the 1960s led to questioning skepticism vis-a-vis -vis the moral authority of the church, whose credibility has recently further suffered from the child abuse scandal. The blatant gap between professed values and actual practices scandalized Christians and non-Christians alike. So Europe is experienced what Charles Taylor refers to as a secular age. Uh, he does not mean that uh, the secular age leads to the demise of religion, but his argument is we have moved, I quote, from a society where belief in God is unchallenged and indeed unproblematic to one in which it is understood to be one option among others and frequently not the easiest to embrace. More specifically, to apply Taylor's secularization argument to the situation of European Catholic Christianity, European culture is de-Christianizing itself. God, religion, and the church move to the background, whereas individual autonomy moves to, moves to the forefront. This does not mean, I argue, uh, as conservative Christians like to imply, that liberal secularism automatically results in ethical relativism. Actually, what we see is that liberal and secular values contest, replace, and compete with Christian values, particularly on issues of sexual ethics and family values. Personal experience and conversations with liberal secular friends suggest that they are anything but lukewarm about the values they confess. The problem then is not a clash between Christian values and a confused postmodern wilderness, but a clash between traditional Christian values and liberal secular values. Although a clash on sexual ethics and family values uh, equally can coexist with the co convergence on socio political issues such as the fight against poverty and social injustice. <coughs> Church leaders across Europe have tried hard to stem themselves against this tide, but the liberalization of popular attitudes and state policies on contraception, abortion, and more recently same-sex marriage highlights the limits of the church's influence in Europe. Liberal visions are increasingly tension in outright conflict with traditional Catholic values. Current debates on gay marriage, most recently in France, reflect this tension. And what even further complicates this picture is something uh, I think that I haven't, we haven't discussed it a lot, but I think it's very important. Because most of the time, uh, and kind of this refers to the question of who is making the argument in favor of uh, Europe's uh, Christian identity, kind of a stronger, uh, a stronger uh, practice, uh, more kind of radical uh, witness. And most of the time, these people are not Pope Benedict or uh, my colleague Brad Anderson. Uh, these people um, are the extreme political right to kind of misuse uh, uh, Christian rhetoric for the like, xenophobic, Islamophobic, anti-Semitic, anti-European, and homophobic policies rather than out of a faithful and authentic concern about the role of Christianity in Europe. It is a Christian imperative then for the Catholic Church and its members to critically ask who is advancing arguments in favor of Europe's Christian identities and for what kind of political purpose in order not to be co-opted by the extreme right for the unchristian and often anti-Christian worldviews. The disconnect between culture and religion in Europe means that the Catholic Church increasingly cannot identify itself with the surrounding European culture, which historically helped to create and sustain. At the same time, secularized Europeans find the Church's stance on hot bottom on issues odd, outdated, even unjustifiable, and discriminatory. Secularism has not cancelled out religion, though. Olivier Roy warns, uh, rather, secularism is helping to reshape and reform its religion as an autonomous category largely independent of the sphere of culture, society, and politics. And I argue that religious people themselves are actually implicit in this move towards a purer concept of religion, which, uh, as Bill showed yesterday, creates kind of many new blind spots, as the standards that are expected of what it means to be a good Catholic are be becoming increasingly higher. 
It's neither sufficient nor possible to simply receive the sacraments, show up at church on Sundays, and be carried through life by a largely supportive surrounding culture, which was pretty much the face, uh, pretty much the rule for my kind of grandparents' generation. It's only my parents' generation in Europe where kind of that traditional culture of Catholicism kind of broke away. Rather, deep personal faith coupled with commitment to Christian practices, even if they involve painful countercultural positions, are becoming the new imperative for ordinary Catholics, but especially for Catholics in leading positions in both church and politics. Historically, arguments about the dechristianization of Europe are not, uh, not new and have surfaced during the French Revolution, the 19th century conflict between Catholicism and liberal modernity, and the 20th century persecution of the church in the age of totalitarianism. What strikes me as a novel novelty, though, is the extent to which the dechristianization of Europe is not predominantly the result of an oppressive hostility by outside forces, but is also driven by conscious, voluntary policy of exculturation. This process, Olivia Croix explains, occurs when a hegemonic religious tradition retreats from the culture <coughs> which it hit her toe had been organically linked, but which it now increasingly perceives to be contaminating, negative, or pagan rather than simply non-sacred, I profane. Whereas Europeans are forgetting about the Christian heritage, Christians are increasingly turning their back on the dominant culture. What further complicates the picture, and that's my next section is about, is a far-reaching disagreement about European Christians when it comes to the question of how to react to the liberal and secular pressure that is weighing on Christianity. Should Christianity be modernized, or should Europe be re-Christianized? The typical reaction of liberal Catholics, of course, is to call for a more modern form of Catholicism in line with the spirit of the Second Vatican Council. Traditional Catholics, on the other hand, worry that distorting interpretations of the actual texts of the Council have already made the Church too worldly. In their view, renewed emphasis has to be put on re-evangelizing society in accordance with traditional papal teaching. Ultra-conservative Catholics, such as the followers of Archbishop de Febre, founder of uh, the Society of uh, St. Pius uh, X, would even claim the papacy in the aftermath of the Council made too many compromises with modernity and no longer legitimately can speak on behalf of Catholic orthodoxy. European liberal Catholics, on their part, uh, like to blame the restorationist policies of Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI <coughs> for the demise of the Catholic Church in Europe, especially the hard stance on abortion, contraception, gay marriage, divorce, and female priests. One of the most uh, prominent liberal Catholic critics is the Swiss theologian Hans Kühn. Together with uh, Ratzinger, who in 2005 became Pope Benedict, Kühn was the youngest theological expert advisor during the Second Vatican Council. Both served together as uh, theology professors in Tübingen before Ratzinger, of course, returned to his native uh, Bavaria, having become somewhat wary of the intellectual atmosphere in, in Tübingen. Um, Kühn and Ratzinger personify two very different strands of Catholicism, which fundamentally diverge in the diagnosis of the causes of the Church's contemporary problems and in the prescriptions of how to move forward. What I want to do is, I don't want to kind of pigeonhole the, kind of the complexity of their thoughts, but I want to argue that they, uh, their arguments are very much shape, but also constrain the political uh, imagination uh, in, in Europe. Uh, perhaps I'm talking too much about Germany and, uh, and Austria, in, in this section, but kind of these kind of contrary approaches are very, very uh, prominent uh, as you engage with contemporary uh, Catholic, intra-Catholic uh, discussions. In his 2011 book, Can the Church Still Be Safe, which I think should be translated into English uh, fairly soon, Kuhn blames Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict for failing to continue the project of the Council. Uh, uh, liberal Catholics such as Kuhn, supported by progressive priests and parishioners in Austria and Germany, insist on the importance of radical internal church reforms. These should include an end to mandatory celibacy, allowing women to serve as deacons, if not even as priests, relaxing moral rules uh, on contraception, allowing remarried Catholics to receive communion, and permitting intercommunion services between Catholics and Protestants. Elsewhere, Kuhn warned about the putinization of the Vatican and went as far as arguing that the sidelining of critics promotion of former associates, the disempowerment of the Russian parliament, and the synod of bishops, and the resistance to real reform reveals striking parallels between Putin's Kreml and Benedict's Vatican. For Benedict, of course, on the other hand, he put the stress on reforming and changing the world rather than the church. Concerned about widespread moral relativism, increasing selfishness and global injustice, he emphasized the need of permanent individual conversion, celebrating the sacraments, personal commitment to traditional church teaching, maintaining church discipline, unity, and new evangelization. 
Ratzinger has collected writings on ecclesiology, uh, which recently have been published in German, I think not yet in English. Uh, they reveal that his emphasis on changing the world around the church is a threat which has permeated his writings for many decades. This early as 1958, Ratzinger warned that the Catholic Church in Europe had become a church of pagans. In contrast to earlier times, the pagans were now in the midst of the church rather than outside. In the early church, faith was based on an act of conversion and deep personal faith in Jesus Christ, which led to an, I quote, authentic living community of the faithful. Well before secularization began to fully, uh, to fully kick off in Europe, Ratzinger already implored the Christianity had ceased to be a personal decision to become a more or less random political, cultural characteristic of the Occident. To move forward, Ratzinger suggests a tighter sacramentary discipline, the sacraments without faith are useless, and a stronger distinction between church and non-church as a prerequisite for renewed missionary efforts of the church to convert the new pagans. The call for reform is virtually universal, but the terms of reform are comprehensively disputed. George Weigel rightly notices in his prologue to his latest book, Evangelical Catholicism. So we have many uh, uh, theories uh, uh, of reform, uh, but uh, uh, they can differ uh, radically. Liberal and conservative are perhaps two political charges and two polarizing concepts to serve as helpful labels uh, for understanding how European Catholics fall down on different sides of an important ongoing debate. The Vatican's emphasis on fighting social injustice, combating climate change, deepening disarmament, protecting migrants, and promoting fair economic relations between North and South can hardly be classified as conservative. Moreover, liberal priests and lay people are often much more committed to conserving traditional local parish structures uh, than their conservative counterparts who believe that the church may have to shrink again to a vibrant, small, and healthy size before it once again may expand in the future. Pragmatically speaking, the liberal Catholic bishop making the church conform to the liberal side as a pipe dream as this project enjoys uh, no support among key decision makers inside the Vatican and little enthusiasm in the global south. In this context, it will be fascinating, of course, to see how long the liberal Catholic honeymoon with Pope Francis will last. Uh, the Holy Father's interest in the poor church being close to the poor and his humble style have been very well received so far. On a deeper level, as John Allen explains, uh, the church in the global south tends to be morally more conservative on issues such as abortion, homosexuality, and traditional family values. The liberal issues that dominate church debates in Europe, celibacy, female priests, sexuality, divorce, abortion, secularism, relations with Protestant, are not necessarily the priority issues in the global south, whose concerns have more to do with material survival, peace, development, fighting poverty and injustice, and dealing with the effects and cause of war, migration, and rival capitalism, the growth of rival evangelical movements, uh, or Islam. A conservative vision for how to move the European church forward, I argue, suffers from a different and more nostalgic illusion. Rather than realizing and accepting the mainstream culture of contemporary Europe, is fundamentally disconnecting itself from Christianity, there's a strong tendency to sulk and to look backwards to Europe's Christian roots rather than forwards to the future. The conservative outcry with the remission of a reference to God in the preamble of the EU Constitution and following its failed ratification the Lisbon Treaty serves as a case in point. Descriptively, at least, the treaty's reference to the cultural, religious, and humanist inheritance of Europe is a compromise solution that reflects the actual realities and belief patterns of Europeans uh, more accurately than wishful thinking about Europe's Christian identities. So my argument uh, would be uh, forget uh, Europe's uh, Christian roots and think more about the present and the future. What I want to do in the last part uh, before concluding, uh, do I still have some time? Yes, you do. We have uh, about 10 minutes. Uh, I want to speak about uh, some trends uh, which I argue uh, are very important, kind of descriptively, I want to speak about those trends which are very important kind of, to understand uh, kind of contemporary transformation of European Catholicism. I want to try to discuss them in a way uh, that becomes bl neither blinded by liberal illusion nor succumbs to kind of conservative nostalgia. Five trends. First, the traditional model of the parish, of the local parish, is becoming either outdated or is in need of radical transformation. Given the decline in the number of practicing Catholics, as well as the ensuing decrease in the number of vocations to the priesthood, larger and different organizational models of bringing Catholics together for praying, worshiping, and celebrating the sacraments will be necessary. 
This process is already well under the way in Germany and Austria. The Archdiocese of Vienna, for example, my home diocese, under the leadership of Cardinal Schönborn, recently launched a development process called Acts of Apostles 2.1, with a view to help create more conducive structures for missionary activities and to proactively respond to the priest shortage and more limited financial resources. The core idea behind such restructuring processes is the realization that the Church in Europe simultaneously leads both larger uh, territorial units to reduce administrative redundancies and uh, to take administrative burden off uh, priests, uh, to ensure better cooperation, also create more collegiality among priests and have them kind of live together in, in communities rather than kind of having them kind of work isolated from each other, uh, and also to sell buildings that no longer serve any essential purpose. Smaller faith-driven communities, on the other hand, led by lay people on a voluntary basis, um, are thought to be essential for keeping and spreading the faith in a personal manner in close proximity to people on the ground. Second, the most creative and dynamic spiritual and pastoral centers no longer tend to be found in traditional parishes, but are linked to diverse groups, movements, pilgrimage sites, ecclesial events, and monasteries, such as the ecumenical community in Tissé, France with its youth gatherings, the Focolari movement, Communion Liberation, uh, the Camino de Santiago in Spain, the World Youth Days, uh, or the Cistercian Monastery of Heiligen Kreuz in Austria, with its award winning monks singing Gregorian chants in Latin, having a record number of vocations. Uh, uh, I think it never, they've never had so many kind of priests since, since the Middle Ages, until Benedict uh, went there as well during his visit to Austria. While I'm not aware of any more thorough or methodological studies on the topic, um, it's an anecdotal kind of experience of mine that mainstream Catholic youth, youth associations that are closely connected to parish structures such as the Katholische Jungschau in Austria or the Katholische Junge Gemeinde in Germany, in Germany predominantly focus on social issues such as organizing games, singing, or offering summer camps while neglecting, seriously neglecting catechesis. It is interesting to note then the most visible Catholic forms of fellowship seem to be offered by communities and groups whose apostolic world is informed by much thicker or by a uniform notion of Catholic identity. The third trend. The church in Europe is getting poorer and is facing the probability of losing further material and constitutional privileges. As the number of practicing Catholics declines, financial contributions sooner or later will decrease as well. Constitutional symbolic privileges such as the presence of crucifixes in classrooms or state aid in collecting church taxes are increasingly difficult to defend. Pope Benedict in his speech in Freiburg during his 2011 uh, apostolic journey to Germany recommended the profound liberation of the church from forms of worldliness. So in a big Entweltlichungsdebatte in Germany following this, uh, this visit. So that the church becomes a more credible witness and regains her worldly poverty. Such a less worldly attitude, uh, the Holy Father argued, is especially important to counter a, con a counter a contrary tendency. If the church becomes self-satisfied, settles down in this world, uh, becomes self-sufficient, and adapts herself to the standards of the world. Rather than seeing its material riches as an asset, Pope Benedict conceded that even though the church in Germany is superbly organized and is more than enough by way of structure, it is not enough by way of spirit. Providing a strong implicit critique of the liberal argument that the church needs to change in order to modernize its teaching, Pope Benedict put the emphasis on individual change of heart. While the German bishops did not believe that Benedict's argument about Inveltlichung questions the government's collection of church texts, there is a very curious shared opposition of secular liberals and conservative Catholics who wish to see this practice to end. The former see it as an inappropriate confluence of church and state activities, the latter are outraged that a failure to pay church tax actually leads to de facto communication, excommunication uh, from the church. Um, there was a very uh, provocative and well written article a couple of months ago. Uh, Jesus said, told uh, his disciples to go out uh, and uh, uh, to the ends of the world to, to be missionaries rather than to collect uh, church tax. But in Germany, if you don't, if you don't uh, pay church tax, you're de facto excommunicated. You cannot uh, receive uh, the sacrament. Uh, they also uh, are cautious about uh, supporting stifling bureaucratic structures of Catholic institutions that may be lukewarm about traditional family values, reflects kind of George Weigel's argument in the news context. And uh, uh, they, would, they, they, are, they would argue that it strengthens the kind of worldliness uh, that the Holy Father wanted. Fourth 
forth after centuries in which Europeans sent out missionaries and priests to other continents, we're now beginning to experience reverse missionary activities, where priests from countries such as India or the Philippines will come to Europe to serve local Catholics. In an ideal world, foreign missionaries would be an exciting personification of the global nature of the church, and they would help to revitalize the spiritually tired continent. The move away from small parishes and the import of priests from the port would not be without tension, however, as people would probably have to att attend Sunday Mass further away from their homes, and as cultural and spiritual differences between foreign priests and local congregations could cause conflict. Also, priests from the Southern Hemisphere might require special training to come to cribs with a condition of material abundance and spiritual poverty, which tends to be the exact opposite of conditions in the global south. Fifth, that's where uh, the PowerPoint slide kind of comes in. The European Church is losing its dominant role in the global church. It is already anachronistic, but fifth, let me explain to you uh, 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 this, uh, this slide. So you can see the top, the top table is from nine. All statistics are taken from the church, from the official statistical yearbook of the church, which is a great resource for our church as statistics. It's published by the Vatican. The top table is from 1973, and the lower table is from 2010. You can see in 1973 there were like 3.8 billion people living in the world, and uh, now we are uh, at, at 7 billion. In 1973 there were 695 million Catholics. Uh, in 2010 there were almost 1.2 billion Catholics. So kind of we've never seen so many uh, Catholic, baptized Catholics in, in world history. Of course, this is uh, much more to do with the population growth, because the in, in, in terms of percentage of the total population. Uh, uh, Catholics now uh, make up 17.5% of the world's population as opposed to 18.3% in 1973. Interestingly, in terms of percentage of the total number of Catholics, uh, we can see the biggest increase in, in Africa when it comes to, uh, to percentage points. So in Africa, 1970, 6.4% uh, were baptized Catholics. In 2010, 18% of all Africans were baptized Catholics. In absolute number, I think the biggest increase actually is in, in Asia, even though <coughs> the, the large population, the, the, the increase in percentage is just uh, whole point. Uh, two, two, two point, 2 2.7%. Of course, the biggest uh, loser, if we want to kind of organize a game among Catholics in different contexts, <coughs> the biggest loser in, in, in relative terms uh, are European Catholics. In 1973, European Catholics made up 37.9% of all Catholic, worldwide Catholics. In 2010, uh, that percentage point kind of dropped to 23%. It's the only decrease uh, European uh, Catholic. Interestingly, however, um, the argument of, uh, about the demographic loss of influence of the Catholic Church is not yet uh, reflected uh, when it comes to the make of the, the demographic uh, makeup of the cardinal lectures. So actually, the number of cardinal lectures are compared to 1978, the second conclave with the, the kind of latest conclave, and percentage points. The, the percent of uh, cardinal lectures actually increased from 50.5% in 1978 to 52.2% in uh, 2013, that is. I want to finish with one conclusion and one warning. Uh, to conclude, we're likely to see increased tensions between the Catholic Church on the one hand and government authorities and popular culture on the other hand. To the extent that mainstream European culture and Christianity would alienate themselves from each other, it would not come as a surprise to see American-style culture wars enter into European context. We're likely to see a church that will enjoy less constitutional privileges that will be more involved in political opinion shaping and cultural interventions. We will see a church that will have to come to grips with its new minority situation. European Catholics will have to be missionaries, or they will not be. If the Catholic faith is not being incarnated, passed on, promoted, will gradually wither away as it is no longer sustained for surrounding supportive culture. Christianity will become a continuous and highly personal choice challenge and journey that only begins rather than ends with baptism, first communion, and confirmation. 
Amidst all these radical transformations, the big temptation, though, is to reduce Christianity to an elite project of the committed few, rather than present as a source of salvation for all. Put differently, the church in Europe must not become a scared subculture, it must become a sacred counterculture. Sociologically, it's understandable that a church under cultural siege shores up its identity. Pastorally, however, this risks scaring away the huge middle ground of people, especially young people who are neither principled atheists nor practicing Catholics, but who may be culturally drawn to Christianity while having questions and doubts. In the past, the inherent connection between Christianity and culture in Europe ensured there were sufficient points of contact. In the present and future, these contemporary doubting Thomases will drift even further away and they will have no chance of personally encountering the risen Christ if there is no outreach or they only encounter judgmental, elitist, or inward-looking attitudes on part of practicing Catholics. And here, actually, kind of my critical kind of point or question for the argument kind of by Brad, also kind of Bill of his work, and with Michael, um, where you can see a strong, or I at least maybe I misinterpret, it's kind of a strong kind of criticism of kind of cultural uh, Catholicism, as it was kind of somewhat a lukewarm, kind of not radical and authentic enough. Um, I actually think in Europe, we will actually lose out from kind of losing kind of that cultural Catholicism, which really kind of pastorally kind of brought in kind of many people to the church, which otherwise might never have had any, any points of context. So uh, I would be interested if you have uh, some comments on, on that. Pope Francis' recommendation that the church would not get stuck in the sacristy and become self-absorbed by internal debates, but cast out into the gutters of poverty and suffering in both material and spiritual form provides a very helpful and timely warning in this regard to, kind of to overcome uh, the self-referential debates. As European Catholics, we must never believe that Christians are better than non-believers or people of other religions. As European Catholics, we must never believe that God only works for Christians and abandons non-believers. As European Catholics, we must believe that by serving, loving, and being with the poor, the marginalized, the oppressed, and the non-believing, we follow the message and person of Jesus Christ. It will not be easy to become or remain a Christian in 21st century Europe, especially for young people, but it certainly will not be boring. Thank you, Alex. Uh, our next speaker is Paul Murray, and Paul is a uh, systematic theologian at the University of Europe. He's going to talk about how things look in the islands. Well, thank you, Peter. And um, to Peter Casarella, also thanks to Michael Buddy and Bill Kavanagh for the invitation to share in this um, really fascinating uh, initiative. It's um, an auspicious time, as others have mentioned, for us to be um, asking what it means to be a genuinely world church, what it means to think, act, and witness Catholic according to the whole. Um, auspicious time as we sense that with the election of Pope Francis, perhaps a fresh surge of the spirit in the life of the church. De Paul's Department of Catholic Studies and the Center for um, World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology are making an exemplary contribution here and uh, are to be thanked and appreciated. Now, uh, as I discern them, um, and if I, if I discern them incorrectly, I apologize, but as I discern them, the structuring concerns for this project are, um, are well, I've identified five at least. Let's just I don't say what they are. To reclaim the political significance of Catholic distinctiveness, rescuing it from co-option. To harness um, and release the Catholic potential for promoting forms of ecclesial solidarity capable of relativizing and transcending more limited definitions of identity focused on nation, tribe, class, gender, and the like. Thirdly, to note that for all the destructive effects of unfettered globalization, it does at least serve to render board boundaries permeable, uh, borders and boundaries indeed. And uh, fourth would be 
to explore how Catholicity, <clears throat> authentically lived, is capable of outplaying and redeeming globalization by demonstrating a form of unbounded communion consisting precisely in the valuing and fulfilling of local contexts rather than the manipulation, submersion, and even eradication. And then, um, of course, finally to ask how these various concerns um, can take specific form in differing historical, geographical, and political contexts. So that's, that's the framework I think we're operating in. Now this um, short paper accordingly explores how these concerns resonate within UK Catholicism. <clears throat> and there are again five points for obviously into pentateutical ways of operating. First, I um, introduce some historical perspective which shows UK Catholicism as now maturing towards what I'd refer to as a committed pluralism and modes of engaged distinctiveness. <clears throat> Second, I'm going to point to the um, institutional context of much UK theology as an example of such engaged distinctiveness and committed pluralism. Third, I'm going to very briefly introduce a, a fresh ecumenical strategy that's been developed in this context, receptive ecumenism, which promotes an intensification and expansion of Catholicity precisely through appropriate learning or receiving across ecclesial boundaries. Fourth, I turn to some explicitly politically focused expressions of this concern for engaged distinctiveness. And here I'm going to distinguish between the role of attempted tactical gains within an existing order and of that and the role of strategic sacramental prophetic performances <coughs> capable of disclosing a different logic. And then finally, I ask what it might really mean for the church to be the true polis, and for Catholicism genuinely to disclose a redeeming Catholicity capable of addressing the wounds of globalization. So obviously this is a large agenda, and uh, in this short paper I'm gonna be doing little more than sketch the argument in outline. So let's take our first major heading, which I'm going to dwell on uh, this area probably longer than the others. Well, Let's be honest about this. One might be forgiven for wondering what the UK has to contribute to the discussion of global Catholicism. Um, on the one hand, there's the residual pathological English delusion of standing over against the nations rather than being intimately related and mutually dependent. This might suggest that UK Catholicism has little to offer beyond more of the same old Northern Hemisphere Eurocentric imperialist modes of thinking. And then on the other hand, Catholicism, sorry, on the other hand, UK Catholicism <coughs> might appear as an irrelevance even in its own right. After all, are we not dealing here with an, with an historically Protestant nation where the monarch is head of the established Church of England and which Catholicism was all but systematically eradicated. Is not Catholicism's major contribution to the imagined community of England's sceptred isle to have been the alien other over against which English history, politics, and identity was self-consciously defined? And inasmuch as English Catholicism did survive, has it not been characterized alike by a certain insularity, defensiveness, and political irrelevance. Well, the burden of this section of the paper is to argue that such are understandable, but fundamentally misguided assumptions, and to suggest that recent developments in UK Catholic self-understanding relative to public engagement may be of wider relevance. As regards its supposed insularity, well, from the birth of Henry VIII's autonomous English state, and certainly since the outlawing of Catholicism under Elizabeth, and the consequent move of English Catholic education and seminary formation to continental Catholic Europe, 
English Catholicism became the most internationalized dimension of early modern English society, and continued so to be for at least two centuries thereafter. There's, that taps into a whole sort of revisionist agenda which is being explored um, in, in the UK at the moment, particularly in a conference in the summer. And again, moving on, from, from the birth of the Industrial Revolution onwards, well, it was economic migrants from the impoverished Catholic communities of Ireland and the Scottish Highlands, who in large part met the expanding need for cheap labor. And such waves of Irish Catholic immigration in which my own story is largely situated, continued right through the 20th century until the inflated Celtic tiger began to roar for a while in the 1990s, attracting some of the younger emigrants home. And alongside that were significant waves also of Polish immigration, Polish Catholic immigration, and more recently, very significant numbers from the Philippines, from various African <coughs> countries, and from the Indian subcontinent. Indeed, in contrast to the general steep decline in Catholic numbers throughout the Northern Hemisphere, and I entirely concur with Alex's analysis, in London and the southeast of England, numbers are actually expanding again as communities are refreshed, refreshed again by the influx of Catholic immigrants and refugees. Indeed, even in our own little parish in the far north of the country, in prayers spoken in parishioners' native tongues this Easter, there were over 15 world languages represented. So relative then to the essentialist myth of English identity, there is some cause behind Catholics traditionally being represented as the cultural other, l'étranger, those who do not properly belong. It was within the living memory of my grandparents, for example, that employment adverts could routinely state, Catholics need not apply. All of this gave rise to complex senses of English identity within English Catholicism. Within its more aristocratic strains, there was a sense of being the living link with England's medieval Catholic past the real England that had been Mary's dowry. And in turn, the Irish derived strains of English Catholicism had their own sense of being, well, yes, at home, but not properly fitting in. The fundamental datum for each was about being Catholic, not about being English. Now, this has changed considerably as tribalism has waned and communities have become far more open and fluid. But until relatively recently, and certainly within my own memory, English Catholic sensibility was a form of eccentric existence, with its center of gravity elsewhere than in Englishness, and with proud recognition of being a member of a family that extended everywhere. In turn, the assumption as to the political quiescence of English Catholicism is also open to question. Far from surviving through apolitical withdrawal and purely private preservation of a non-conformist religious practice, classical recusancy, the penalty-bearing act of refusing the oath of supremacy, together with the coordinated English mission led by Tridentine priests formed with a clear understanding of the Pope alone as the ultimate authority in the Christian world, were each self-consciously political activities. The English state was entirely right to view records and Catholics as a threat to its self-claimed absolute power, for they precisely were. Nor should the political significance of historically widespread economic disadvantage and cultural marginalization amongst the larger immigrant-derived sections of English Catholicism be lost from view either. Instilling in the DNA of English Catholicism a commitment to social justice, perhaps shown most emblematically in Cardinal Manning's public involvement in the London Dock Strike of 1889, and his influence on the production of Rerum Novarum, the first great social encyclical. 
Admittedly, however, the political potential of English Catholicism has not been as, always as clear to view as in the case of either Guy Fawkes or Cardinal Manning. For the greater part of the 20th century, the combination of social disadvantage and closed tribalism and of a proud and somewhat conflicted reserve in other quarters, jointly militated against any significant visible or political engagement at the common table of UK society. Rather, the Catholic default was to a certain Catholic parallelism. State schools on the one hand, Catholic schools on the other. Christian aid with the other churches on the one hand, the Catholic Fund for Overseas Development on the other, Catholic social services as distinct from state social services, and so it goes on. Such parallelism helped preserve a strong sense of distinctiveness. Sorry, whilst such parallelism helped preserve a strong sense of distinctiveness, it did little to release the potential and witness of Catholicism in the public sphere. But for a host of complicated reasons that require far more sophisticated analysis than is possible here, it's interesting to note that things have changed very significantly in recent years and decades. It's notable that contemporary UK Catholicism is now far more confidently and visibly engaged with the public realm across a number of fronts. One of the key enabling factors here has been the success of the Catholic educational project and having produced a sizable Catholic middle class, now fully represented across the professions. Another pivotal factor was the remarkable impression our previous but one cardinal, Basil Hume, made on the nation as a whole, effectively becoming regarded as the spiritual leader of the nation, far more so than the then Anglican Archbishop of Canterbury, George Curry. There was a sense, and has been since, of English Catholicism having come of age and being ready to engage the common table. And aiding this also has been the de facto broader pluralization of UK culture. The point is that for the watchdogs of constructed Englishness, there are now other others, and indeed far more exotic others than Catholics to worry about. Now I don't want to paint a naive picture here. There are some real losses also. Sure, the relatively closed tribal communities, which in my own memory still characterized English Catholicism, were limiting in all sorts of ways. But there were also highly effective contexts of formation in Catholic distinctiveness. A distinctiveness that's been put to work, that's been put to publicly to work in myriad ways as those shaped by it have moved into leadership roles in UK society. But the very openings of English Catholicism that made this possible, the very opening up of English Catholicism that has made this move possible, has also served to make it far more difficult to transmit a similarly strong sense of distinctiveness to subsequent generations. There's real danger that the emergence of a sizable English Catholic professional population that is both self-consciously distinct and faithfully publicly engaged will be a brief flowering. Progressively inclined, committed Catholics, amongst whom in some respects I would count myself, would do well to recognize the irony that maturely creative Catholic existence generally requires a traditional formation. And on this, I agree with Stanley Howells. I would disagree with him, however, a little, and for, relate, for related reasons in relation um, to the value that can be placed in sustaining various cultural carriers of the tradition. And here I uh, endorse again what Alex has just been saying. Sure, this um, seeking to preserve cultural carriers can never properly function as an alternative to the core vocation of nurturing a committed minority in the ways of pr prophetic existence. But nor do I think we should underestimate the value of, of sustaining widespread if relatively low-level familiarity with the language, symbols, stories, and even practices of Catholic Christianity. But that's a different story for another day. Now, leaving such acknowledgments of loss aside, 
One of the positive possibilities and constructive challenges posed by this state of procedural sectoralism, to adopt Rome Williams terms, in which we now find ourselves, is that for as long as the diverse traditions can each both produce distinctively formed adherents and regain a sense of dealing with the whole, then we have a context in which distinctive public engagement from deeply and diversely tradition perspectives becomes possible. This provides us with the opportunity to seek to learn how to live pluralism properly. With this, uh, using the twin categories of committed pluralism and engaged, sorry, um, I, I intend to deal with this using the twin categories of committed pluralism and engaged distinctiveness. Committed pluralism speaks a dual commitment. On the one hand, to recognizing that we live in a radically pluralist world in which the unqualified uniformity of the tribe is no longer available. But on the other hand, to explicitly adhering to a particular tradition practice of faith precisely in this context. And then with engaged distinctiveness, I mean a deep sense of traditioned distinctiveness that neither leads to sectarian withdrawal, but, nor, but doesn't, uh, and issues in modes of explicit public engagement. Um, and, but together with this requires negotiation across and between traditions, what Williams refers to as interactive pluralism. Now this is an issue these are issues for all the traditions and not just for Catholicism. If we're to have modes of religiously shaped involvement in the political that go beyond individual motivation, then we need to find ways of bringing diverse traditions into relation and conjoint deliberation that are not intrinsically conflictual and which are capable of promoting social flourishing. This is the issue of our age, which is why religion is back on the agenda in departments of political science government and international affairs, geography, law, etc. In terms of theoretical resources for this and theological resources, as a forthcoming number of modern theology will explore, the interfaith practice of scriptural reasoning is of significance here. Just as analogously in the intra-Christian context is the earlier mentioned strategy of receptive ecumenism to which our attention will shortly briefly turn. More immediately, however, another example is the distinctive ecology of the relationship between theology and religious studies that now routinely prevails in UK universities, together with the embeddedness of Catholic theology in this context. One of the benefits of Anglican establishment, and there have been some benefits, I would have to say, is the fact that we have formal departments of theology, formal departments of church-linked traditioned hospitable theology in all the traditional UK universities. A tradition which has survived and prospered even now they are all now fully public, fully secular universities. There are two key developments that have been interesting here. Firstly, as Anglican hegemony over UK culture has waned, these departments have moved from being purely Anglican operations to being multiply traditioned. Um, shaped by particularity and diversity, and hence to be wonderful laboratories in the kind of interactive or committed pluralism that we've earlier noted. And a second development is that as theologians have seen the need to take practice as well as doctrine seriously, whilst anthropologists and sociologists of religion have come to appreciate the need to understand ideology and theology properly to decode uh, webs of practice, then at its best we find, we find theology and religious studies in constructive rather than competitive relationship in the UK Theological Academy. Now, the point is that the vast majority of Catholic students and Catholic theologians operating in the UK operate in this context and not in the context of Catholic institutions. So they operate in a context where Catholic theology is done alongside the other traditions, alongside all the other subject areas, alongside all the other modes of analysis that one finds in a broad subject university. And this is, I think, good for the formation of theologians, 
but it's also good for society in terms of a laboratory of um, committed pluralism, interactive pluralism. Um, some of the other points here that are, in, that are interesting is that um, this provides, therefore, the right context in which to form Catholic theologians who are going to be shaped by the two values I was earlier noting, of committed plural plurality and engaged distinctiveness. It means that um, for the church, there's an immense amount for the church to be able to learn in this context. But there's also great opportunities for the church. This is a context in which there are no questions, no lines of analysis that in principle can't be pursued. It's a great opportunity for Catholic conversation and witness to happen in the public square. And it also makes sense because universities are stable carriers to link back with what I was saying earlier into the future. Um, this context for UK Catholic theology that we've just outlined, um, where traditions operate alongside each other with particularity and integrity intact, a mutual critical conversation, and drawing, drawing upon all the other disciplinary resources, makes for an interesting place for ecumenical theology. And it's from this context that, that a fresh strategy for ecumenical engagement and theological interaction has emerged um, that is uh, and that traditionally uh, ecumenical theology until relatively recently has really focused on seeking to clear up misunderstandings, seeking to solve problems between traditions and so come to an agreement. And that's had, that strategy has had immense success, but is now somewhat derailed by the fact that the, the significant issues that now remain before us don't lend themselves to being overcome in that way. Receptive ecumenism, rather than giving up with the ecumenical task and saying it reduces to simply praying together, being nice with each other and going on marches or something, receptive ecumenism seeks to turn this around and make of it an opportunity. It seeks to say that rather than prioritizing the teaching of the other and the seeking to find agreement, instead priority needs to be placed on what each tradition can itself learn. There's a J J.F. Kennedy-style reversal. Um, instead of asking not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, receptive ecumenism is saying, ask not what your ecumenical other needs to learn from you, ask what your tradition needs to learn from your ecumenical other. Now, much ecumenism is about the getting the best China tea service out because the distant relatives are coming around and we want to be seen in our best light. Receptive ecumenism is somewhat different. Receptive ecumenism is the ecumenism of the wounded hands. It's recognizing that for all the gifts in our traditions, we're each wounded, each limited, have our paralyses, our pathologies, our difficulties. And receptive ecumenism recognizes that we cannot save ourselves. We cannot solve our own um, problems. We cannot address our own wounds. So what it promotes is learning across difference in a way that can speak to our needs. To look not what's, to prob what's problematic in the other, but what's um, a resource that can be learned from them. So it's a learning across boundaries. And what's interesting in terms of the broader theme of what we're about this week is that the conviction is that far from this being a dilution of Catholicity, it represents an enrichment of it represents the repair of what's broken, the potential extension of it in fruitful ways. It represents ultimately the fulfilling, not the diminishing of Catholicity. It sees Catholicity here as project and not just as given. Um, the relevance of having taken that slight detour into um, receptive ecumenism will come a bit clearer later on. Let me turn now to the other heartland part of this, and I will try and be as brief as possible. Let's turn to UK Catholic political theology. Um, I deal with this under the categories of tactical gains, as I indicated earlier, and strategic sacramental prophetic showings. These refer to two quite different modes of political theological engagement, and both of which I believe are necessary. And in saying that I think both of them are necessary and actively to be pursued and promoted, 
That is somewhat contrary to some influential recent emphases in Christian political theology, which place celebration certainly on the latter, but have questions about the value of the former. By tactical gains, I refer to attempts that are made from within the existing order and from within the prevailing logic of things to make things better in incremental ways in such fashion as seeks to address someone's suffering or to, ad or to um, address a felt inadequacy. Now, this um, uh, approach to seeking tactical gain within the existing order, it can happen and generally does happen in a rather modest reforming fashion that effectively focuses on seeking to curtail and ameliorate the worst consequences of the prevailing order and to refine its general workings whilst effectively remaining within the system. It can, however, also have a more radical end in view of seeking to move through a long process of incremental change that will finally serve to transform the current system as such, whilst the mode of proceeding is tactical, its end in view is actually strategic of wanting to alter the landscape, ultimately. Whether um, that's ever going to be possible, of course, whether it's ever going to actually be able to deliver such fundamental change when it's still working within the current logic of things is a moot point. So let's turn to our other category. If tactical gains refer to initiatives taken from within the existing order and logic of things, strategic sacramental prophetic showings refers us to the need not just for focused, pragmatic engagement in Christian, within Christian existence, but also for imagine, imaginative, visionary acts that are, in, that are inspired by and operate out of a logic and order that transcends present conditions but which we're called to anticipate and to live out of and to disclose to the world um, uh, as fresh possibilities in ways that can expand imaginations and excite hopes and desires. Uh, it's one example that's often cited, which is very important to myself also, would be the Vocalare Economy of Communion project. Inasmuch as such initiatives are about thinking and living beyond the limits of current prevailing logic, the concern for such sacramental prophetic shows might be regarded as idealist in the extreme. But it's actually far more serious and strategic in, in intent than that would suggest. It's serious in a deeply theological sense. It's serious because the Christian conviction is that far from denying reality and com simply comforting oneself with illusory dreaming, this Christian revision really is rooted in the reality of things. It might be counterfactual, but it is the reality of things, and therefore um, we can live out of it and anticipate it in, an, in, an, in empowering ways. Well, if it is serious, it's also strategic, because it's... Um, it is really intent, this, this concern to um, identify and live um, sacramental prophetic showings is driven by um, the intent of transformation and not just amelioration. Indeed, it's rooted, they're rooted in the conviction that it's only through such imaginative um, expansion of way, current ways of thinking that real transformation can ultimately ever come. In this context, it's fruitful now to turn to note a number of current UK Catholic initiatives in political theology and Catholic social thought and practice that reflect and are self-consciously shaped by the principles of committed uh, pluralism and engaged distinctiveness that I noted earlier. As articulated by the principal architect of these initiatives, Anna Rowlands, who currently teaches at King's College London, the joint aim behind them is to work, quote, so that a distinct British strain of Catholic social thought, so social teaching and thought, rooted in the distinct histories and cultures of these islands, can again take its place in a national discourse on current affairs and in the ongoing social reflections of the Catholic Church worldwide. Um, I'll review these as briefly as possible. These initiatives are firstly establishing 
a national network to bring together academic theorists and analysts of Catholic social thought and practice on the one hand, and engaged practitioners, activists, people involved in grassroots community organizing on the other. The vision is to provide a context for reflective practitioner work, um, to, um, to put the academic work in service of this. And the conviction is that scholarship here needs both to be strategically focused and deliberately engaged. It needs to be as concerned to host and shape public debate as it is to promote, um, uh, it needs to be as concerned to host and shape public debate and to promote the implementation of its implications as it is to develop and analyze the ideas in the first place. Secondly, with that, the, um, uh, there's a project um, nearing completion to uh, establish a UK chair in Catholic social thought and practice, the only one of its kind in the UK to be um, a focus for this work, not, the, not to provide the leadership of it, but to provide the academic focus for it. A third um, initiative has been a high-profile public lecture series, uh, which has made um, significant media attention, focusing on the crisis of capitalism and the common good. A fourth has been a Bishop's Conference-sponsored project on better business, bringing CEOs and uh, like leaders of major firms uh, into conversation about developing more virtuous business practices inspired by Catholic social teaching. And finally, an emerging project, again through the Bishops' Conference, on formation for Catholic political vocation. Now, it will be apparent that most of these initiatives come more under the category of tactical gains than strategic sacramental prophetic showings, although presumably some of the initiatives to be engaged by the network that I outlined will surely come under that more ambitious, imaginative category. So given that most of the work thus far seems to be more in the tactical than the, um, than the sacramental prophetic, I just want to take uh, the opportunity to enter some comments here on the worth of these tactical initiatives. Um, as we will all be aware, there's been an influential line in much recent Christian political theology and social ethics, claiming that all such tactical work within the prevailing order tends towards a self-frustrating collusion with the distorting and fundamentally distorted order of the state. Stanley has been touting this for years, although softened more recently through working with Roman Coles on radical democracy. And some of Bill's um, writings tend in some sense towards this, of course, but in a much more nuanced way, I want to say. Um, uh, and, um, but I, I just want to add a couple of caveats and say I'm not entirely convinced by this unless we um, recognize that it's an appropriate valuing of one without a complete diminishing of the other. Um, I take all the dangers that, uh, um, that are associated with focusing on tactical gain and the way in which it can lead to co-option, collusion, etc., etc. But um, I think that, uh, I'll give you two reasons, I think that authentic Catholic response um, needs also to have that tactical dimension. The first is a slightly historical odd one, and that it's in line with the medieval system. I want to suggest it more in line with the medieval system of relative local regional authorities. Um, to say that what we need to do is to relativize the state, not to seek either to destroy it or simply to ignore it. Thomas More in Robert Bolt's Man for All Seasons captures it. I'm the king's good servant, but God's first. So um, the tactical is about trying to be God's good servant first, but in the realm of the state on occasion. Secondly, uh, a more pastoral reason here, we need to seek to minister to existing wounds and suffering, as well as seeking to disclose the body healed. It's the Marxists who sacrifice the people of today in the name of the promise of tomorrow. Christian hope and charity needs to be demonstrated in pragmatic and practical ways, as well as in clear sacramental prophetic ways. As Augustine said, commenting on Jeremiah 29, while the two cities are intermingled, we also make use of the peace of Babylon. And we do this, he continues, even though the peace, the people of God is delivered from Babylon on, uh, by faith. 
And finally, my final point um, that I'll, I'll just uh, briefly touch on. Redeeming Catholicity for a globalizing age, healing the wounds of Catholic contradictions. More basic than any specific initiatives ad extra, whether pragmatically aimed at tactical gain from within, or prophetically aimed at disclosing fresh possibilities, is the claim variously made by Stanley, John Milbank, and Bill, that before any such initiatives, the being and life of the church represents the true form of Christian political theology, inasmuch as here is found the authentic story of the human sociality, well told, well performed. Now, um, and with this, Bill has, as earlier noted, also claimed that Catholicism is to be seen as authentic globalization, globalization redeemed, as it were, that can hold local and universal in appropriate relationship. I want to say very clearly that I think this is a really welcome return of the church to the center of political theological discussion, one that I genuinely and strongly affirm, and that's not just rhetorical um, strategy. Um, equally, I want to say it needs to be clearly acknowledged that if this fruitful perspective is not to collapse into a form of ecclesiological idealism, then it needs to have integrated within it a critical ecclesiology, a political theology of the actual lived practice and organizational reality of the church that views ecclesial reality both as potentially sacramental of the kingdom and as in need of continual conversion and renewal if it is to fulfill even partly this calling. This focuses particularly on the claim that Catholicism manifests a graced, authentic holding of the relationship between local and universal in appropriate, mutually fulfilling relationship compared with globalization's sacrificing of the local to the universal. The point is that on the contrary, this re represents the very seat of Catholicism's own dysfunction. This, um, let's think back to the, the conclave and the reform agenda, the, the, it's collegiality that kept coming up, which is um, the way in the, which is code for the need for us to put this right in our own house. So I want to finish by saying is that if, if Catholicity is indeed to be able to show a redeemed and redeeming globalization to the world, as I also believe we're capable of doing, and called to do, then it needs itself to be redeemed. It needs itself to be redeemed at this very point. And further, given that we can't save ourselves, to go back to what we were touching on earlier, then we must turn to our ecumenical others, the alternative experiments in ecclesial practice, and ask them to help. We must engage in learning across the borders, across the boundaries, if we are to fulfill our own identity, calling, and mission. As, Catholic, as, as, as Catholic Church. If Catholicism is to be sign and sacrament to the world in a globalizing, globalizing age, it needs to have its own Catholicity healed and enriched through appropriate ecumenical learning, of which we earlier spoke. And here we see that ecumenical learning and ecclesiological reform are not simply redundant old internal church matters they are themselves profoundly political, and not simply church political, because they're, to, they're not simply church political to do with ecclesial politics, but they're to do with the public political dimension of Catholicism, as they go to the very core of the sign value we're called to give to the world. And on this, I entirely agree with Stanley and Bill, that the sign we give through our distinctive sacramental prophetic existence is first and most importantly, it's the first and most important way in which we bear political Christian witness to the world. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we have a couple minutes before you dismiss for lunch and I dash off to teach a class. Uh, so we'll set time to quickly answer your questions. Please.
If we take the, the chance to go back to the table that Alex had up, and, and while that's warming back up, uh, one source that might be helpful uh, from both the standpoint of uh, distinctive engagement, as Paul's talking about, and learning from the ecumenical other, uh, but also in this context of... It, it's okay. I, I'll, I'll, it's okay, don't worry about it of uh, political science is a book called The Reenchantment of Political Science, edited by Thomas Halke from uh, University of Kansas. And he has an article in there about uh, Mennonite engagement that's distinctive, uh, but talking about middle axioms and the use of language uh, to, to engage in a distinctive way. I realize how ironic that is to suggest Catholics look to Mennonites for how to engage culture, but uh, that's just one small part of the picture. Um, this is interesting to me because I notice a couple of things when I look at it. I notice that despite all of the discussion of secularism in Europe, the total percentage of the Catholic population in Europe dropped over this 40-year period two-tenths of a percent. While the European uh, portion of the Catholic Church dropped 14 points. My question, which is not delicate, it's rather indelicate, is to what extent is the concern today not so much secularization in Europe, but the decrease, the reduction of European control of the church. Because that's what I see when I look at those numbers. Despite the fact that in the end the cardinals, the percentage of cardinals has gone up for Europeans despite the fact that they only have one quarter of the Catholic population. So and I don't mean to be so indelicate, but I, I'm struck by that, uh, that Really, the big difference there is the number of the, the European share of the church, not so much the Catholic share of Europe. I think I'm, I'm concerned about both. I think I'm concerned about secularization in Europe, and I'm concerned that Europe is way too overrepresented, and I'm concerned that it. Uh, certainly in the pontificate of Pope Benedict, I think Europe received well too much pastoral and diplomatic attention from, from the Holy See. I think the church would be better off if the attention was going to spread out to other parts of the world. I have a question for uh, Paul Murray. I really enjoyed what you talked a lot. I thought it was uh, really nicely done. Um, in your conclusion, you called for a little more openness and, uh, to tactical political strategies and so on, and then called for engagement with other ecclesial communities in order to arrive at that and a more openness. Um, I wonder, too, if there's not a missing term in this thing, in, in, this, in this strategy that you uh, identify. Um, which I didn't find implicit in your talk, although I might have uh, some appeal to the natural law. Um, if you look at the church's crisis of credibility, maybe in the UK at least as much as in the United States, uh, two of the issues that it seems to me are the child sex abuse scandals and money. And both of those have, uh, the church has been on the receiving end of a lot of criticism uh, by people that don't have to belong or perhaps don't even belong to ecclesial communities at all. They just know that some things 
financial practices or these other practices are, are just wrong. And um, a lot of secular voices know that as well as communal voices. So I guess I, I want to say that your notion of engagement politically is in a way um, uh, almost too churchy uh, in the sense that there are plenty of other people, um, say like Hitchens or someone like that, who would have something to contribute to these important issues that the church needs to address and doesn't care at all or even worse about the church or is opposed to it but still we benefit from that so where does the natural law fit into your your analysis um, thank you um, well i think it's um absolutely authentic to the catholic tradition that we take um seriously what we can discern through natural the modes of reasoning. I think one of the exciting things that's happened in Catholic theology is that um, we've ceased to uh, we cease to run that by saying that um, okay, natural reasoning gives us the building blocks that we can all agree on, and we're going to lay down um, we're going to lay down the foundation and the ground floor, and then uh, maybe put a couple of additional funny little Catholic stories on top of it. You know. So, I mean, if that natural law in that sense, I don't, I don't run with, but I don't think Catholic theology generally does run with now anyway. Um, if we're saying that from the, from the particularity, uh, the, the distinct narratives and um, practices, traditions and Catholicism, that that's not, um, that's not in a kind of bubble that's separated off from the rest of creation and perception, but can always, always find resonance, uh, multiple resonances, okay? Uh, not necessarily identity, but resonances which are important. And, and indeed, we need to take that quite radically because it's, that's not just an apologetic exercise of saying, okay, what we've got in our tradition, we can find a way of linking with what you already know about turns around the other way because you know we, we Catholicism is a great capacious mansion and we tend to only live in one or two rooms of it and there's all the stuff that's in those other rooms we can be reminded by uh, by uh, what we learn and are challenged by in the other disciplines the other modes of operating so I mean that's part of in terms of how that's all implicit in the talk um, it was implicit in what I was saying about the virtue of situating distinctively Catholic theology in the heart of the public secular university. That's one of the ways, okay? Because it's a, and that's not just because it allows us to browbeat the rest of them with Catholic truth, you know? It's because it puts us where we need to do our learning as well as our teaching. Um, it's implicit in what I was saying about uh, tactical gain um, as being important in a rounded Catholic political theology. Um, in a sense, I'm saying that the, uh, I do want to say, I do want to privilege the, um, the, the, the role of the practical, sorry, the prophetic, the sacramental. I want to kind of run with that, what we've rediscovered there. But I also want to say that kind of in the way that um, if that's, if, just as philosophy is to theology, there's a way partly in which tactical gain is to our sacramental showings. We need to be doing both, yeah? Um, we need to be engaged in all the sort of um, complex um, negotiation that goes on there. So it's, it's absolutely there, but it's there in a slightly different way than we would have once rolled that out in Catholic theology. Thank you, members of the panel. Thank you, our audience. Uh, I think we will now uh, dissolve this session so that you can continue the conversation face to face. Thanks again.